call the planning board meeting March 16th, 2021 to order. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the planning board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The planning board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to remotely attend and participate. Zoom will allow all planning board members, applicants and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Please use, okay, blah, blah. So um, first order of business is the uh, approval of the meeting minutes from January 19th, 2021. Do I have a motion or any comments? Motion we approve the minutes from the January 19th, 2021 meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any comments? Maureen, please call the roll. Certainly, and I believe Mr. Bedensky is just about to join us. Okay, you can start. start yeah, uh, uh, yeah, hi guys. I, Mark, I, I, I didn't get the invite, so I joined through the town portal, just so you know. Okay, oh, okay. so there's just been a motion to approve the minutes. Are you feel ready to vote, Mr. Bedensky? Sure, uh, I, I, yes. Uh, Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Palmer? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Hubner? Yes. Okay, motion carries uh, unanimous. Next item of business is the uh, Astro Lane Private Road Amendment. Um, Introduction, Maggie Burlam is requesting amendments to a planning board <laughs> approval granted October 15th, 2019. Amendments including amendments include adding surface pavement to the previously approved gravel private road, relocating the eight Astro Lane driveway to a portion of Astro Lane that has not been approved as a private road, replacing the private road sign with a no outlet sign and adding fencing to the activities allowed outside the building envelope. The application will be considered for completeness in a public hearing. The plan will be reviewed under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance. Um, the, and Mag, is that Maggie? That is. Are you, are you going to present the changes? I am gonna present them. Um, thank you so much. I know it Jim, says- Jim, can I interrupt like actually well, before uh, Maggie gets started? Sure. Yeah. I, I probably ought to, just offer this that I, I also live on Astro Lane uh, up the road a, a ways, um, but feel that I certainly can be impartial in this matter. I sat on the original application and the board had no problem with that, uh, but I just wanted to tell anyone who didn't know that and remind folks who, who did. Does anybody have any reservations about that? None at all. Okay. No. no. Uh, Mari, we don't need to vote on allowing him to continue sitting and do we um i it no. didn't sound like a it didn't sound like a full conflict it sounded like more like a disclosure and okay. therefore i would say you don't have to vote okay. i would like to ask the applicant are you expecting anyone else to be attending this meeting like yes i'm briefly going to introduce our project and then actually steve bradstreet our engineer is going to present okay. our and, and the reason i ask is there's someone in the participant list named steve and I'm, I'm going to assume that's Steve Bradstreet. Yeah, I'm thinking that's Steve Bradstreet, yes. He should be logged on. OK. So Steve, you, you want to take it away? Uh, I'm just going to do a quick, brief introduction oh, okay. to the project. All right. And then I'm going to pass it over to him. Um, so you know, I think we all know what we're here for tonight. We're looking to amend our planning board approval that was um, provided to us in October of 2000. Um, 18, uh, 19, I believe, um, which provided our lot, our single, single family lot with the legal frontage that we needed um, to, uh, to build our home. And we, uh, we were provided with that and we built our home and we're in it now. And we're coming back to you because we'd like to make some further upgrades to the 80 foot portion of private road um, that was approved. And in addition, while we're here, we'd like to make three other small modifications, which is to modify some signage that's located in the public portion of Astor Lane, which is irrelevant at this point and is confusing to drivers. Uh, we'd like to remove a significant portion of our driveway to remove some uh, quite a bit of impervious surface um, on our lot, as well as move the uh, driveway entrance down uh, in front of our garage. And we'd like to be able to add a um, fence on our property. 
Um, I'm, I, 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 the only reason I wanted to speak briefly here is um, part of the application materials that we presented with our submission to you um, included a current conditions map of the neighborhood. I wanted to explain why we presented that separately from the engineering drawings. Um, there's confusion about the gate uh, that's always existed and, and I wanted to just nip it in the bud ahead of time in case anybody has any specific questions so that we could move past it to discuss what we're here for, which is to upgrade the portion of road. You can see on the um, current conditions map where the gate exists. This gate uh, is a private installation within a private portion of the road. It's not included here um, on our regular engineering plans because it really doesn't have anything to do with what we're here for. It was uh, a, a gate that was uh, agreed upon as part of a settlement agreement by most of the residents of Astor, Stevenson, and South Street, as well as their, um, their uh, road association. The gate cannot be modified by anybody, including us. It can't be moved. It can't be changed. It can't be breathed on um, unless everybody that was part of that agreement agrees to it. So I want to just clarify uh, at no point did we suggest that we were going to touch the gate to anybody and we're not going to. It's going to stay exactly where it is. Um, so that's all settled. We're not intending on changing how we um, enter and exit our lot um, in terms of which street we come in on, although it's sort of irrelevant because everybody has rights to use all portions of the private roads that exist through here. Uh, but there was some concern from some folks about that. I just wanted to state that's not part of it. We're not part of the road association. Um, but it's irrelevant as well. It, it, that, that governs South Street and Stevenson. Um, you know, Noelle and I certainly have invested, uh, there was some concern about, you know, how much we pay towards that portion of road. We, we've, I think, invested more in, within this public portion of, I mean, the private portion of this road than all of the homes combined on it probably ever. So I don't think there should be any concern about financial, um, you know, contributions to the upgrade and maintenance of the road. Um, we, uh, so we will continue to go in and out through Aster. So I just wanted to go through this briefly um, so we could kind of move on. None of the portion outside of the 80 foot extension that we're looking to invest more money into is really relevant to what we're here for tonight. So with that, I'd like to pass, unless anybody has any specific questions, I'd really like to pass this over to Steve so that he can kind of walk through the um, uh, upgrades to the private portion of road that we would like to um, to uh, make and to address. I believe there were some um, comments from the town engineer. We are totally fine with including all of those into our plan. And I'm going to have Steve walk through about uh, to discuss what how we would address those to the town's satisfaction. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Bradstreet. I'm a private consultant uh, working for Ransom uh, Consulting. Uh, for Maggie on this project, and I was originally involved on the, uh, the original approval. Um, Maggie had uh, touched base on uh, the items that would be improved, the extension that was done uh, a year and a half ago to the uh, road by paving it, changing a sign out. Um, her driveway, which on her private property comes in off of that um, ex road extension, and goes down the entire frontage of her property and then turns 90 degrees into the garage. So it's very, uh, it's a very good idea to remove that driveway from her property, come off uh, further down directly into her driveway. So uh, those are, the, and then the, the uh, fence that uh, Maggie is proposing. Um, I think that uh, what uh, the we received the March 8th uh, comments from Steve Harding. Uh, his first two are just sort of background, so there was no response necessary. Um, but on the plans, the area that will be paved uh, will be paved with a pavement buildup in accordance with uh, the town standards. Uh, as far as the roadway width per station, we will um, put those dimensions on there where they transition. Right now at station 100, it is at um, 18 feet, but you can see that it widens as it goes uh, further up the uh, street. Uh, we will put the transition stations and the widths at those locations, um, but that road was approved at that design width uh, previously. So what we're doing is just paving it to the town standards. 
Um, if you recall, there was a paved berm at the uh, beginning of the project, roughly station zero plus 20 or so. And that directed, uh, originally directed water off of Upper Aster Lane across the street and into the existing ditch system on that side. What we did with the previous approval is we removed the first two feet of it um, on the easterly side, I should say, uh, so that the water along that gutter line drains into a new ditch, riprap ditch system, culvert going under her, uh, Maggie's driveway, et cetera. So the water is being taken care of on our side of the road, Maggie's side of the road, uh, getting off and into a riprap ditch that was previously approved. And then the rest was uh, exiting across the street um, to the existing and then what was uh, rip wrapped in our project also. So what we're noting or what Steve Harding asked for is that um, that paved berm be relocated and we will uh, not knowing exactly where that location will be because of the existing driveway, etc. And with the proposed grading, um, the berm will take on a little different characteristic uh, because the road will be crowned uh, per town standard. So it won't go straight across the road as it's shown now. It will be angled like a gull wing uh, to direct that flow. Um, Steve brought up a point of uh, waiving the stormwater requirements. Uh, it's very appropriate for this size project. Uh, the existing gravel uh, that was put in there uh, has obviously now uh, been used for a year and a half. Uh, the surface has silted up. It has become impervious in itself uh, and is acceptable as being transferred over to a paved surface that is impervious also. But then you have to realize that all the driveway on uh, Maggie's property will be removed and revegetated. So in that area, that 20 foot uh, or so buffer in that area where the existing driveway is will be removed. So in fact, we're actually reducing the impervious area fairly considerably um, with this project or with this proposed amendment uh, in the project area, we are actually reducing the uh, impervious area. So that's a, uh, a big thing that we wanna point out um, there was a note three, I believe, on the or note one on the plans. I had a typo. Um, it, I think it said with instead of without. So we will be changing that. I was talking about the permissible with the need for replanting. It should be without the need for replanting. Uh, will be changed in the final version. And then uh, the uh, note three in regards to the sign. Um, the existing sign will be removed and replaced with a no outlet sign, which is a, uh, what everyone knows is a dead end sign, but that is the common terminology now uh, is a no outlet sign. So all those things are uh, graphical in nature. Um, it doesn't change any of the design other than some notes and dimensions uh, and a request. Uh, so those things will be uh, placed on the plans uh, with a letter of response uh, directed back to the town, um, addressing Steve Harding's comments. And then any further comments that may be uh, forthcoming from the planning board tonight, we will also address and put in that same letter uh, responding. But right now the plans are um, with some minor uh, revisions our really final plans, uh, but we look forward to any comments or questions that you may have tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, next thing I'd like to do is uh, open up the meeting to public comment on the project. If uh, Maureen, I guess, let me know if you see any raised hands. I'll try and see if are I we, see. Are we sticking to completeness on this? Yeah, this is just for completeness. I see 20 attendees. Uh, no one has raised their hand to ask 
to comment on the completeness of this application. Okay. Going once, going twice, the public comment on completeness is closed. Um, so does anybody on the board uh, have any questions on completeness? Ray, yeah, Ray, and just because it's easier for me, use your raise hand feature because then you pop up to the top. But I did hear you, yes. Carol Ann, so go ahead. Um, Steve, am I correct in understanding that all of your response regarding the building that section of road to town standard will be done as a narrative, that there won't be any additional drawing showing depth and material and so on and so forth? Uh, well, we have a, uh, on the detail sheet that uh, probably was not included, but was on the originals, I think we had a typical section. Um, wh whatever the requirement is for pavement buildup for uh, base, uh, sub-base and, and uh, base material will be uh, noted on that detail. So it's sort of a, it's noted, uh, but it's also shown on the plans. So you, what you're saying is you've already done that uh, drawing well, that, the that drawing happened. in the original submission. Uh, and I don't have the original submission. Um, I would. I, I just ask because that's the norm is for us to see yes. that, yeah. You'll that see kind it. of uh, pictorial uh, depiction. Yes. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Jim, I have a motion. Um, well, I think according to my scoreboard here, uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess we need, uh, Maureen, we, we do a motion on completeness right now and then we go to the public hearing again for substantive. Exactly. Okay. Go ahead, Jonathan. I was wrong. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Maggie Burlam for revisions, including paving, the grand, por or excuse me, the gravel portion of the approved road, relocating the driveway, updating signage, and adding fencing as an allowed activity outside the building envelope to the previous approved Astor Lane private road located at 8 Astor Lane be deemed complete. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I have a second. Second. Okay, Maureen, please call the roll. Mr. Badensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Huebner. Yes. Motion carries uh, unanimous. Now, next I'd like to open the up to public hearing on the substantive uh, on the substance of the project. Um, let me see if we have any raised hands in the attendees. So we have 22 attendees right now. And if any of them wants to speak, you just hover your, your cursor over your name and there will be an opportunity for you to, well, on the bottom two, to raise your hand. Okay. And I don't see there anybody. are no raised hands. All right. Going once, going twice, the uh, public hearing is closed. Um, so planning board, does anybody have any questions on the substance of the project? Uh, Jonathan. Uh, so I just have a question. I, I, and uh, you knew this was gonna come up, Maggie. Uh, with regards to the gate, uh, that was the concern we heard. What I heard you say is um, that there's no one's going to touch that gate, no one's going to breathe on that gate, uh, which I can understand. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the mechanism that's in place with this court settlement um, that makes sure that gate doesn't get touched? Because the only other thing that I was thinking of, and I don't think it's necessary if there is a court mechanism in place, was to add it as a condition um, of approval that the gate is not touched. but. I, I don't need to add that on if I can just hear a little bit more about what mechanisms in place to assure that that doesn't get touched. Not a problem. Sure. There was a settlement agreement uh, that was the sole outcome of all of the litigation that uh, occurred around this situation. The sole outcome was that a gate would be installed 
essentially in the place that we suggested that a gate could be moved to at our very first planning board years ago. The gate uh, was uh, installed as part of the settlement agreement by us. The gate's maintained by and owned by and maintained by the Road Association. All of the residents, except for one or two located on South Street, uh, Stevenson Street and Astor Lane, as well as everybody in the Road Association voted to uh, place the gate here and to settle our lawsuit. Um, it's been recorded. The settlement's been recorded. Uh, everybody has copies of it. Um, I can't imagine that anybody's gonna get together and agree to do anything different with this gate, but it would all have to be agreed upon by every single person that signed that original agreement. The gate really is not town sanctioned. Lucky for all of you on the planning board, it doesn't have to have anything to do with you, which is why it's not on the plan. It's not approved by the planning board. Uh, it's not your problem um, to really need to deal with it again. Um, we've sort of settled it. It's a private matter on a private road. Um, I think that's probably the simplest way um, to, to put it. Um, it's not the liability of the town and probably doesn't need to be made the liability of the town in any manner, so. Okay, I'm satisfied, thank you. Okay. Carol Ann. Okay, now see if I can remember what I was gonna ask. Oh, the sign. One of the letters we got commented on the sign and whether the people on South Street and Stevenson should have say in changing the, uh, the sign to whatever it is, no, right. no, less, no outlet. Is, is that part of any settlement or was that part of the approval? I'm just no, that is, sorry, the, the signage was part of our original approval. It was a requirement that we install the signage. It has nothing to do at all with our settlement agreement. It's not part of it. That, that sign is located within the public portion of the road. Honestly, I don't really even care that much about the sign, but it's very confusing for people uh, that are just driving down Astor Lane that don't understand that there's now this random gate in the middle of the road. Okay. Uh, and they can't access Stevenson, they can't access South Street. Uh, it, and so if they're looking for those places, they can't get through. So uh, it's just a confusing sign. So it's irrelevant, it doesn't make any sense. We are happy to bear the burden of the cost of changing it to a sign that's town approved within the public portion of the road that simply says no outlet, like dead end, like every other dead end that exists. So that's I, where that comes from. Okay, I just want to make sure it wasn't part of any settlement. Yes. That's part of the approval. Okay. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the road association or or anything. It's really the town sign at this point. Okay. Yeah. Do I have any other questions? Um, do I have a motion? Don't all jump. No one wants to read this motion. No one okay. wants to read it. <laughs> I'll make a motion. Thank you, Marianne. So I'm a new member. I think I have to read the whole thing, right? Yes, you do. So motion for approval. Findings of fact. As set out in B1. Is that enough for me to say? You have to read the whole thing. <laughs> OK. Maggie Burlam is requesting amendments to an approval granted October 15th, 2019 to add surf surface pavement to the previously approved gravel private road, relocating the eight Astor Lane driveway to a portion of Astor Lane that has not been approved as a private road, replacing quote, private road, close quote, sign with a quote, no outlet, close quote, sign, and adding fencing to the activities allowed outside the building envelopes which require review under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance. The Astor Lane approved, number two, the Astor Lane approved private road section been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in conformance, in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings and decisions of those approvals which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Number three, the private road approval revisions will not result in undue water pollution. The slope of the land 
proximity to streams and state and local water resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the private road approval revisions. Number four, the private road approval revisions will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control measures shown. Number five, the private road approval revisions are intended to meet town standards subject to the additional details added to the plans. The private road name change has been approved by the town assessor. Number six, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. Number seven, the private road approval revisions will not adversely impact surface water quality. Number eight, the private road approval revisions will provide for adequate storm water management. Number nine, the private road approval revisions will continue to provide a vegetative buffer throughout and around the subdivision and screening as needed. Number 10, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Maggie Berlin for revisions, including paving the gravel portion of the approved road relocating the driveway, updating signage and adding fences, adding fencing as an allowed activity outside the building envelope to the previously approved Astor Lane private road located at 8 Astor Lane be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town engineer's letter dated March 8, 2021. Number two, that the applicants submit evidence of financial capability to complete the pro proposed revisions. And number three, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision plat. Thank you, Mary Ann. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Maureen, please call the roll. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Huebner. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Maggie and Steve. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're back. Hold on a second. I'm going to be bringing some people on as panelists and moving some people off as panelists. Okay. Um, agenda item number three, town center affordable housing amendments. The town council has referred to the planning board amendments to the town center district to enable an affordable housing project. Section 19-10-3, table to public hearing. Yeah, table to public hearing. All right, never mind that part. All right, um, before we get into it, I believe uh, the town council chair, Jamie Garvin, is uh, an attendee. And I'd like to ask oh. him to go ahead. Were you going to say something, do Maureen? We, I just, do we have to take it off the table first? No. No? No. Okay. I've never. We never had to do that before, I guess. Um, Since we've put it on the agenda, Marianne, we don't do a motion to remove from the table. It, okay. It's considered an active item because it's on the agenda. Okay. okay. All right. Um, All right. Yeah, and so Jay, is Jamie available to, to speak? He's right here. Okay, Jamie's gonna review what our charge is and uh, uh, from the town council. So go ahead, Jamie. Thanks for coming. Yeah, pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you, Chair Huebner. Thank you, Planning Board. Thank you, Maureen, um, uh, for the invitation. Uh, mainly, um, you know, happy to answer questions from the Planning Board if there are any, um, which, which I gather from speaking to Maureen that um, 
there might be some uh, folks that are looking for a, a little additional clarity on this. Um, I guess where I would start off just as introduction though, is to say that um, this item, you know, not unlike any item comes before the planning board is really, um, you know, in line with, with the rest of your all's responsibilities as it relates to, you know, reviewing proposed developments uh, and, and then also providing comments on proposed ordinance amendments, which obviously this falls into the latter on uh, a little bit more. Um, so I think, you know, I don't want to speak for the entire council, but I can represent, I think, you know, what was, what was the um, gist of our meeting where we made this referral to you, which was uh, the council had a very initial sort of sneak preview presentation, as I know you all have had uh, similar presentations delivered to you uh, from the developer. Uh, within that proposal, there were um, multiple requests for zoning amendments or uh, relief from existing zoning requirements uh, in order to be able to make the project viable, uh, you know, in the in the eyes of the developer. Um, and so the council was looking for you all as the experts, um, you know, the advisory experts in um, both our land and pl land planning and, and land use um, regulations, uh, basically to come back and, and um, you know, give us some sort of advisory assessment as to whether or not um, project uh, possible to construct can to write or or construct ordinance amendments that specifically fit what was being asked for. Um, so I guess as a starting point, you know, it's conceivable that one outcome would be, you know, you all through your process could say, you know, we, we don't think we can actually come up with something that meets that need. I, I, I don't know. I'm just, you know, spitballing possible scenarios. Um, alternatively, it, you know, if if there was some sort of draft um, that did meet the request to come up with the language that you felt was consistent um, with the uh, general direction uh, for planning, uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan, and return that to the council um, for us to, to review and consider and, and you know, ultimately vote on whether or not to move forward on. Um, I think more specifically as well, you know, what's, what's obviously in a bit of tension as it relates to, you know, development in the town center generally, and this specific request, um, you know, more specifically, is we've got two um, guiding documents that, um, you know, aren't entirely one another and don't completely reconcile with one another. Um, one being previous town center plan, um, which, you know, obviously, um, you know, contemplated a certain type of development in the town center, specifically with first floor retail, specifically, specifically, you know, a, a certain size. And then a superseding document in the comprehensive plan that um, very specifically uh, alluded to and envisioned the, the need to possibly uh, update, revise, and consider alternative uh, regulatory measures um, in order to meet, you know, several of, of, uh, of the enumerated goals around housing, and in particular around, you know, uh, the, the variety of housing and, and types of housing uh, available in town, and uh, the availability of affordable housing. So, you know, I think the council and I personally recognize that those two things are, you know, obviously run into just a little bit of conflict with one another. Certainly some of the comment that I've seen, you know, from the public uh, by way of email um, sort of addresses that the historical work that went into developing town center plan um, with, you know, how this may or may not either uh, deviate from or contradict um, some of that direction. So, um, but so that all being said, I, I think the council was very interested to hear the planning board's opinion um, about, uh, a, 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 you know, especially since the planning board was involved in the review of the comprehensive plan as well, uh, or, or, or some of the drafting of it, um, that, um, you know, a, a opinion be brought forward on, um, 
like I said, sort of how to, how to reconcile those two things. So I'll pause there for a minute and see if anybody has reaction or questions through the chair. Okay, Marianne. Hi, Jamie, thank you for coming. Um, that, Pleasure. That's been helpful. Thank you guys for um, your time on this. Yeah. So I tend to go to the language of the order that came from the council as mm -hmm. kind of the governing document. And I looked at the first sentence, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council refers to the planning board, development of town center, affordable housing amendments. The amendments should preserve town center requirements to the extent feasible, while also permitting an affordable housing project that provides a substantial public benefit goes on to talk about recommended amendments should be returned to the council by April, whatever. Mm -hmm. It struck me as a, a request or order of the council to do our best job to put together an amendment for you. Not that we would go back and say, we can't do it, but that we would say, here's how it should be done. And I, um, yeah, I, I, and I think, yeah, I don't mean to speak over you, sorry, uh, that um, the, sort of the first part of what I was saying, I think, is exactly that, that I think that's the expectation, but also sort of recognizing that, so the very first part of what you said, and I, I don't have it verbatim in front of me, but about, um, you know, developing this sort of ordinance or this sort of language in such a way that preserves as much of the spirit of the other town center um, regulations. So that was my point about saying, I don't know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not saying this to try and um, uh, lead the witness or anything, <laughs> but you know, you all might say, well, there's no way we can craft, you know, ordinance amendment X in a way that is consistent. Does that make sense? Uh, or in a way that does preserve uh, you know, um, the spirit of, uh, you know, of what was previously laid out or, or, or what, what stands as the existing, um, regulations today. So, um, I, 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 let me try and come up with a, a sort of a fake hypothetical. Um, I mean, loosely based on, on the existing example, but if, if one of the things being requested had to do with the parking, um, ratio and there just wasn't anywhere to put the parking um i would imagine that you all would come back to us and say uh i'm sorry but we can't waive the parking regulation when there literally is no alternative for the parking this is just a hypothetical i'm not i'm not specifically drawing it from you know the existing proposal but does that make sense uh, marianne see I saw Carol Ann shaking her head too. So. <laughs> I was looking at it a little differently that in fact, we might come back to you and say, it can't work, but here's how it should be drafted so that it could work. Preserving the town center requirements to the extent feasible. So I looked at it as we do what we can to preserve what we can, but then we move to the next step of what do we need to do to permit an affordable housing project that provides a benefit. And so that we might actually go back and say, the parking needs to change. Not that we would go back and say, it can't be done right. within the existing ordinance, but we would say, here's the ordinances that need to change. Yeah, I think I think we're saying the same thing, and maybe okay. if I could just clarify or, or finesse it a little bit differently, because um, I I totally agree with what you're saying. The 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 sort of um, roadblock example that I was giving was so what you're saying is, you know, here here's the proposed language that we're offering up, and you know, within that it would be um, clear what needed to change or what needed to be waived in order for that to go forward. What I'm saying is just, if there was simply something that was completely irreconcilable, right? Or um, 
it wasn't just a matter of, well, you know, it meets A, B, and C, but we've got to move on D and E in order to make it work. What, what I'm saying is something that just, you know, literally is not feasible. Does, does that make sense? Is that, I don't know if that clarifies it further. No? I, I guess I, I'm, I was left early on with the idea that we were to come back with something that makes it feasible. That's and, then that, it, and then it would be up to the council to decide yeah. as a policy matter whether you want to. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's let's take it outside of the scope of this language in this particular. It, yeah. in, in that way, it's no different than the short term rentals, right? Or or other things that have have a policy specific um, impact and direction. Yes. Where you all are saying to the to the council. This is this is how the language would be crafted, and you know this this is you know what the requirements would be. You all decide if that's ultimately what you want to do from a policy perspective. Yeah, so I'm yeah. totally on the same page with you on that. Okay. I, I what I'm and, and I, I'm not trying to confuse the matter or 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 make uh, cloud, you know cloud muddy the waters on it. What what I was just trying to say is, I, I guess from more of a technical standpoint, if there if there, there's only so much revision or modification you can do to something, but if, you know, if it, I think the council wanted to know if, if there was something that just was completely inconsistent, you know, a, 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 an absolute ob oblique left turn, that, that whole language about in a way that's as consistent as possible or what, whatever the language in the, in the referral was, you know, if there was something that in, in the opinion of the, the planning board specifically was just such a dramatic left turn. Well, you know, we'd want to have you guys say, well, here's here's this language, but but you should know that it's not in the least in keeping with the spirit of or intent of the previous town center. And the language does that make sense? The, yeah, and the language is to the extent feasible. Right. So I would think that we would be crafting an ordinance unless we came to the conclusion after studying it, that something was just not feasible. Right. Okay. I mean, I think as you know, Marianne and the rest of the planning board knows, it, it's not the job of the planning board to develop policy. Mm -hmm. It's the job of the planning board to develop ordinances that are consistent with the guidance of policy from other, you know, from the council and other you know, planning documents for the town. So, um, so we certainly weren't asking you to, um, you know, uh, weigh in and, and, and opine from a, from a policy standpoint, whether or not you thought the idea of doing an affordable housing development project, you know, was something of merit at this point or, um, or so on. It was just, you know, if, if, if a project like this was to move forward, what would the what would the ordinance uh, language need to look like mm -hmm. um, in order to satisfy, um, you know, satisfy that? So, okay, thank you. I right. see a bunch of other hands. Yeah, so. uh, Carol Ann. I'm gonna let Jonathan go before me because he's usually more articulate than I am. He is a silver tongue devil, that's for sure. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, great, no pressure. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> Jeez. I'm going to let Andrew go first. How about we do that? <laughs> no, um, so, yeah, Jamie, I, I think you just answered some of my questions, but what, what I'm kind of confused about was the language of to the extent feasible. Um, feasible to what? You know, like, feasible to the comp plan, feasible to the current ordinances, uh, because anything's feasible. But if you're, if we're trying to craft it within the, the current zoning and we're getting a, a, and we're basically being requested to make four different changes to the current zoning, um, I, I don't think that that would fall under the definition of easy or convenient. And that's to me what I think of as being feasible. Um, so can you give us a little bit of direction on, on that? Uh, because when I looked at this thing, it was sort of, all right, guys craft a, a, 
a um, affordable housing amendment that keeps in the spirit of the town center, but then because somebody is giving a public benefit, and I definitely agree with, I think it's unanimous on this board that affordable housing is a public benefit, um, but how do we craft that, um, how do we craft that ordinance in a way to allow um, affordable housing, but then also keep in the spirit of the, the town center? So I think the, the the word feasible is obviously what's what's what I'm gathering is tripping some people up. Um, what I would uh, perhaps uh, try and try and put a different context around is obviously um, in no way um, either through the comprehensive plan, public sentiment, or desire of the council uh, is there any is there any um, uh, impetus to to you know make wholesale changes to town center zoning and, you know, direction um, that's, you know, been consistent for a number of years, um, you know, around how we want the town center to look and, and what type of business and, and development we want to see um, sprout up there. So that, I think the, the, the word, you know, feasible relating back to um, a project that has a specific public benefit, and in this case, it's affordable housing. But you, you know, I, I think one could envision other projects that have a specific and, and um, measurable public benefit beyond affordable housing. Um, but that we want to be very careful in in you know maintaining guardrails that you know don't allow for you know wholesale um, changes beyond that very narrow and focused intent. Um, and so to, I think the, the phrase to the degree feasible is, is sort of a nod to, hey, we want to keep all the rest of what's good about our very specific and codified regulations around development in the town center, while acknowledging that for a project like this, or again, something, even if you took the affordable housing out of it, you know, say somebody wanted to come in and build a community center uh, or something I don't I don't know some, something that you know or I know we have a brand, you know recently renovated library but if somebody else wanted to say hey I'm gonna you know, some foundation came in and said we're I, I want to build you a new library you know just making up ridiculous examples for, for the sake of the point um, something that has a specific community benefit well that's probably something that you know should also fall within this right so um, but um, that there's there's no desire there's no um, policy direction. There's no community um, desire to, you know, stray from what's an otherwise fairly tightly construed um, set of regulations for the town center. Does that answer you, Jonathan? It does. Thanks. Okay. Andrew or Carol Ann, are you ready to go? I, I think so. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be kind of black and white on this. Uh, when we when we started this process, the way we approached it was, let's come up with what we would need to do, what would be required in order to allow affordable housing in the town center. And then we send it to the town council and they can take it, they can throw it out, they can revise it, they can do whatever they want. But based on the direction I understood when we started, saying that that's not feasible at all was not even in the, the thought process that we started with. And this, um, uh, you're making this way grayer than it ever was and it's gonna make it a lot harder. Well, I'm certainly not trying to do that. So um, you know, hope, hope from continuing to talk us through, we can, get it more black and white for you. Um, I, I guess what I, I, I tend to think, you know, the, all the laws of unintended consequences and, and um, you know, sort of best case scenarios, worst case scenarios, um, all different things that come out and I articulate was, Rather, this process shouldn't be 
somebody asks for a whole bunch of things and we just write up the language that conforms to what they're asking for. I mean, there needs to be some sort of um, qualitative review and assessment of that to say, well, does this even, is this even doable, you know, in, in our scenario, right? So, um, and I, I don't think anything that's being asked for falls into that if I'm being, you know, putting my own personal view on it. And again, not, not everybody else. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that there's any of the four or five things that are being, that, that fall into that, but that's, I mean, you, you guys know that stuff better than most of us on the, on the council, uh, because you deal with it a lot more closely. And I think that's just where we were leaning you for your advice and, and counsel. So, um, I, yeah. I think, you know, if I, if I, if I, you know, put a politics hat on, frankly, Carolyn, I, I think what, what we probably, it's probably, like I said, I think it's practice and I think it's bad, bad process um, to just take a bunch of requests from any developer of any kind, whether it's residential or anything and say, oh, well, okay, this is what you asked for. So we'll just write it and then and see what the council thinks of that. I mean, I, I think that at every step along the way, there should be somebody asking questions, you know, at, at least to, to vet it and raise, you know, raise observations and, and, and things like that. I agree with that observation, Jamie. And, um, but sometimes you don't know which way the world is moving until somebody come in, comes in and asks for something. And then it gets very cloudy. For sure, yeah. On, and what, why you're approaching it. So. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the other, you know, pieces of practical information to apply to this too, is that if you go back to the town center plan, and even some of what was brought forward in the update to the comprehensive plan, um, that all envisions a sort of reality that hasn't happened. <laughs> So, you know, there's a number of properties that have sat vacant or dormant. There's a number of properties that have had revolving tenancies. Um, and I think that the town center plan was drafted um, with this idealized view of what the town center could be in the form of, you know, some kind of quaint New England village that really hasn't come to fruition. Um, and, you know, if, if if you ask me, that's largely due to market conditions and not policy or, or ordinance um, regulations. Um, so, um, you know, given all that, as you said, Carolyn, you know, there's an element at some point where you have to start being a little bit more forward looking too, to say, okay, well, what, you know, what, what should we be thinking of and considering, um, you know, that, that, that does present as an opportunity um, to make you know, make regulations that would provide for a, a beneficial um, development, so. Okay, um, Andrew. Yeah, um, you know, I think a lot of this is, is you know, the, the feasibility side of things, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is really just um, changing metrics. So 45 or 35 feet to 45 feet, say for maximum building height or one density housing to another density and one, you know, X number of parking spots <clears throat> required per, per uh, residence to another. <clears throat> the challenge I think the board's having is um, what are the, I mean, even, even if we very narrowly scope this in terms of the town center is what really are the, the implications of that? Clearly there, there were implications that were in, were considered when the town center was plan was put together you know why do we care that that the maximum height is 35 feet and not 45 feet when it was designed and does that extra 10 feet um is that outweighed by this public benefit and i think what we're really struggling with is like that is a th these are all policy questions and so we can craft something for sure i just you know is it is it does it is it worth doing, I mean, in this venue for one project. I mean, it, and I think, 
you know, you can say that like, you know, we, we shouldn't be um, tailoring this to one project, but it, it kind of reads that way, you know, the directive to us. So I think that's kind of something that we're really having a hard time with, because I think if we were thinking about this from a planning perspective for the town, we think about, you know, some of the things that I've been asking, is there any place else in town, things like this could go that are logical and that would, would maybe fit the town better or, you know, clearly there's a strong headwind against this project. I mean, I, it, and I don't know if it's going to ever get anywhere because of that headwind, but um, it's, you know, we can easily craft something that's narrowly focused and exceeds all these ordinances that are already in place, but I, I don't know what the implications of those are. And I'm not sure the town council will know what those are, even if you vote on them. Because yeah, you know, maybe there does need to be study. I mean, there has been at least one letter suggesting, do you need to do a parking study if you change this? I mean, yeah, you know, there probably there could be some research certainly done looking at other um, information around the country probably. But you know, I don't know. Do we need a lot more study on this to make even these small changes? I, I really don't know. I'm not sure we have enough experience to 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 know exactly what the implications are. Okay. Um... Jonathan, did you have your hand up and took it down? You're on mute, Jonathan. Yeah, thank oh, okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quick enough on the draw to get myself yeah. off mute. Um, no, I, I, I think what Andrew just said, uh, and just to kind of expand on what he said, it's not mm -hmm. just um, that there's a, there's a headwind of public sentiment, but also is a difficulty in, um, we started this conversation with, talking about hypotheticals, but there's an elephant in the room here that we have a project that has been presented to us and presented to the town council that has very strict requirements um, for it to be, sorry to use this term because I know it's been thrown around, but feasible, um, feasible to make this project work for them. And I think that they've done a lot of work and and, um, and it's, a, it's a very, I commend them for making the efforts to do it, but it's also, very difficult for us because it's basically saying okay any deviation from the things that are going to make this project not work they can't do it and so it, it kind of it's been taken out of that hypothetical realm and really put into that policy uh, discussion which to me i think is outside of what we do as the planning board and i think marianne hit on that earlier so that's sort of where i where my struggle is as well um, I guess the way I look at it, Jonathan, I think you said, uh, give you credit for using the phrase, if this project had been before the town council and the town back when the comprehensive plan and the town center district ordinances were being written, they would have been different. Um, as you said, Jamie, this was our ideal. And as you also just said, it's not having the desired effect. Um, so, uh, and like Carolyn said, to me, you know, come up with, I was, I had Carolyn's attitude, come up with something that can make affordable housing, come up with amendments that can make affordable housing work in the town center. Um, and I guess I was playing, we're going to do that and we're going to send it up to you where the town council then discusses the policy implications of it. Well, I was planning on here's what you need to do to make a plan similar to this work and yeah. trying to make it black uh, and white. Go ahead. So um, what I was just going to say is in my view and, and you know, with respect to John's comment, I, you know, I totally understand the reality of a specific proposal, you know, being behind this, but I don't want to lose sight of part of what I was saying before about whether it be affordable housing. And I know that the, the, you know, the, the request and referral was specific around refer, affordable housing, but there's also that, you know, or, or something else that has a significant community benefit, right? So if maybe if, I don't know if it would be helpful to, you know, broaden, you know, broaden your view of, in, in, instead of feeling like you're, you're, 
you know, so closely associating the, 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 the amendments with this very specific proposal that's been brought forward. I mean, if this proposal fails, you know, for any number of different reasons, maybe the developer just says, hey, you know what, we changed our mind, we're not gonna do it. And either somebody else comes in with affordable housing or somebody else comes in with something that is, again, some other, um, you know, demonstrable community benefit, then conceivably these amendments should apply regardless, right? Okay. If, if, you know, if the council is saying, yes, we think there's a policy benefit to having greater flexibility uh, within this specific area of the town center and, you know, see development happen and, and have it be the comment that has specific community benefit to it. Okay. So do we, do we have till July now? Say that again, Carolyn. So I remember I, I watched. Do we have until July <laughs> <laughs> or August? So I, I I did watch. I did watch. I think it was your very first workshop uh, when you guys were. Um, uh, I, I think it was one of the early on workshops where maybe the developers had come and presented the same presentation to you that they had presented to the council, maybe slightly updated. But I think Jonathan, you you had a very specific comment about, you know, hey, look, if we run out of time, we go to the council and say, we need more time. And this is why. And, you know, that's what my expectation would be. Um, you know, there's, I don't have any specifically artificial timeline. I know the developer presented, you know, a, a, a straw man timeline, you know, that they're looking to work with in terms of getting shovels in the ground and getting all their approvals done and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, while we, while we don't have an interest necessarily in, in unnecessarily drawing this out, I, 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 don't, I don't think the council would object to if there was legitimate reason and, and work being done against um, the referral, um, you know, if whatever the date is in April comes and, and the work isn't done yet, then, you know, we talk about it then, but. Okay, expect a letter. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't in my in my nearly six years on the council, I don't remember the planning board or any other committee coming to the council asking for an extension for something and having that extension be denied. So, okay. all right. Does anybody else have any questions? I wouldn't for, for, for Jamie. All right, Jamie, are you going to hang around for a while? Yeah, I'm happy to. If you guys are discussing this more, I'm happy to hang around and. If, um, if anybody, you know, has questions, I, I, I can come back to another meeting or through Maureen, talk individually or, or what okay, have Maureen, you. Maureen, so. do you have his, his cell phone number? You can maybe text him instead of making him hang around unnecessarily. I think it's, I don't mind hanging. I got nothing else to do. Oh, this don't, is what I do. don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, with that, I don't see any other hands being raised. I'd like to, to move on. Um, I know uh, Zanton Company has an update, uh, and I think you've all gotten a letter on uh, the first floor retail. But I'd like if uh, Nathan could take a couple minutes and just verbally go through that. Uh, I guess, Maureen, if you could make him a panelist. Um, I've promoted Nathan Zanton and Robert Monks, and I'm looking to see if there's anyone else. I need to promote it looks like we're Kristen Martin I'm looking for her there she is okay got her thank you Mr. Chairman um, my colleague Kristen Martin will speak for a couple of minutes about what we found when we analyzed the impact of our project doing part of the first floor as commercial space um, which this board asked us to look at at the March 2nd workshop then I'll speak for just a minute um, on a couple of other points. We'll keep our presentation to about three or four minutes total. Kristen? Sure, good evening, everybody. Um, so yeah, we provided a letter and I'm just gonna kind of briefly summarize that. Um, but we ran two different scenarios to try to see if we could make commercial space work in the property. Um, we assumed a couple of things. We assumed that, that any TIF ask we have would remain unchanged. And we assumed that the cost of 
construction per square foot for the residential areas would stay the same as we had previously planned it. Um, and we included a lower construction cost for any commercial space because it would obviously be less finished than the apartments that include kitchens and all of that. Um, so the first scenario we ran was to remove six of the one bedroom units on the first floor that faced out on the village green, um, which would allow for two 1900 square foot commercial areas um, in that space. And what we found was that by removing the six apartments from the um, financial model, we had to also reduce the, what we would be receiving from main housing for subsidy and the amount of tax credits we would be awarded would be reduced, which would result in less equity from the sale of those tax credits. Um, we also would have a reduction in our income because commercial space doesn't have the same income uh, as residential area. So there was a reduced capacity for us to take on mortgage. So the amount of mortgage debt we could um, support went down. So all of that resulted in a financial gap for the project um, of about $400,000. So 400,000 less sources than we have uses for the property. Um, and more impactful than that though, in this scenario was that the cost, um, the total development cost per unit would exceed the standard that main housing has. Um, they have a cap on how much you can spend um, on the development cost per unit. And because we're losing six units, but there are all these fixed costs that don't reduce at the same rate, um, we end up exceeding the main housing guideline, which would mean that we wouldn't be eligible for main housing financing. Um, so the second scenario we ran was to assume that we wouldn't have to eliminate any apartments that we could find two 1900 square foot spaces for commercial um, and that we would find other space for the apartments to exist in the building. Um, in that scenario, we saw no increase in main housing subsidy or the, the equity from the tax credit because that stays stable if the unit count stays stable. Um, but we did find that because commercial income doesn't cover construction in the same way that residential does, there would be a financial gap um, in this scenario, it was about $250,000. But really the main issue with this scenario is that really there isn't any room to put those six apartments anywhere else. Um, the building footprint can't really spread any more than it has because of the side setbacks um, with the side lots. And so really the only way to fit those six apartments anywhere else would be to go up a fifth story um, which would of course mean an, another height increase ask, um, which would be probably in the range of 55 to 58 feet in height. Um, so those were the two scenarios that we ran. Thanks, Kristen. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just, so just, I'll just make three quick points. One is um, just to remind you all that what we're proposing is 49 units, eight, uh, eight two bedrooms and 41 one bedrooms. The one bedrooms would be about 600 square feet. The two bedrooms would be about 850 square feet. Of those, 39 would be affordable, set aside for households with incomes below 60% of the area median income. And the other 10 would be rented at market rates to people regardless of their income. Um, just also, secondly, wanted to mention that we had a really good public meeting last week on the, on the 10th. Um, it was by Zoom, uh, 35 or so people came um, we uh, recorded it and we'll, we'll I, I think it's available on the, on the Cape Elizabeth Facebook group. Um, and also we will, we um, uh, have created a website for this project called dunhamcourt.com. Um, and we will make the, a link to that neighborhood meeting available to anybody who contacts us through the website who would like to see it. It was, it was a, a, an hour and 40 minutes, lots of questions, lots of back and forth. It was very, um, it's very civil um, uh, and uh, I think got a lot of information out. Um, the website, and this is the last point I'll make, the website has on it a brief summary of our project, um, architects renderings, FAQs, uh, frequently asked questions and their answers, some information about our company, how to contact us, and links to stories about the project that have appeared in various publications and on the local TV news. Um, and again, that's dunhamcourt.com for anyone who wants to go check it out. That's all we have as a presentation, um, but we're very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time.
Yeah, thank you very much, Nathan and Kristen and Robert. Appreciate your time. Are you are you going to hang around for a while? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Um, the next, does anybody have any questions for them before we move on with this? Okay. Um, all right. So the next thing I I have is to open up take to take public comment um, and. I'd like to limit this to 15 minutes total, but we'll just see how many people want to want to speak. And I want to limit each person to three minutes. So Maureen, do you have your timer? I have it ready, yes. Okay, I guess let's look for some hands to see if anybody from the public wants to speak. Okay, I had a hand, there it is. I'm going to um, allow to talk. Robert Gibbs, it said. It looks like he's muted. Okay, Who's go that? ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, this is Rob Gibbs. I live uh, 109 Delano Park in Cape Elizabeth. And thank you to all of you who are spending time parsing through these difficult uh, issues of what the interplay between the planning board and the council's mandate is. It's been interesting education for me. I'm gonna keep my comment really short. I just really am pleased to see that there's a sensible, reasonable project to bring affordable housing into the town center. And um, I feel that with a lot of other people, obviously you all agree that this is a public benefit, but I just wanna underscore that I think it's a great thing to see uh, this project and hopefully other projects are going to focus on what we need to do to make this town affordable for more people in terms of, of housing costs. And on the issue of the, of the town center, I feel like adding this uh, increased density of population into the town center can only help with the, uh, the goals of the town plan to have the, the village come into development over time. So in short, thanks for all of your attention to this. I, I'm really supportive of Cape becoming a more diverse, affordable place for both people who live in this and work in this community already and uh, uh, hope we can find a way to make this happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. I see uh, Josh Bentian, if I hope I didn't butcher your, your name. Can you hear me? Yep, you're, you're on. Thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me some time to speak. Um, Nine Rocky Hill Road, um, speaking today as, as, a, as a resident, but also as a, a fellow developer. Um, I, as a resident, I, I think this is a great project. Um, you know, I, 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 I think uh, a good use of this space. Um, I understand and appreciate the challenges that the, the board and the counselor juggling right now, <clears throat> um, but as a developer, um, and I just full disclosure, Bobby and I have partnered on previous projects. I'm not affiliated with, with Nathan's group. Um, I, I first and foremost have a, the greatest deal of respect for, for Nathan and, and Kristen and Amy. Um, I think they're the, the best of the best in terms of affordable housing developers. So I'm, I'd be very happy if they did a project in our town. Um, secondly, but we, we did a, a conversion of a mill uh, in Sanford, my company's Northland Enterprises. Um, and we did 36 units uh, on the second and third floor and 22,000 square feet on the ground level. And that was due to a town center zoning that the town of Sanford had, uh, had in implemented. And that was seven years ago. And <clears throat> we have a waiting list of 60 people for the upper floors and yet to have full occupancy on the, on the ground level. And, and have just actually gone through a zone change with the town of Sanford to allow housing uh, on that first floor. So I can, I can speak to the challenge. It's a chicken and egg problem. Um, I think that Cape, we've got a little bit of that downtown where uh, retail tenants may be viable, but I don't think this is the right site for it. And I think having 49 units um, of, of quality housing is going to help the front lot, for instance, uh, secure a really good retail use. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I really admire you guys for taking this on. I know it's not easy, but um, I think it's a great project. And I, I hope that you can work through the changes that are necessary with the zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I guess I was gonna ask you about the first floor, but you answered that question in, in uh, your speech. So that's interesting. How, how many 
square feet on the first floor in that mill building. Do you remember? So we have 22,000 square feet. So it's really big. Um, we've had, we, and we're going to end up having 11,000 that's going to maintain as, as commercial. Um, but what's been interesting is we've had, you know, restaurants come and they look around and, and Sanford's different. It's, you know, it's in the, in the heart of the mill yard and we're really the only mill that's been redeveloped. But they look at these other buildings. They say, if these were filled with people, we would do a restaurant here, but they just didn't, you know, they, they, they didn't want to be there without the bodies. And so, um, so that was compelling for the town or for the city of Sanford to allow us to add, you know, seven more units on the ground floor. Um, it's just, it's just hard. And the economics are really difficult with the rents that are, you know, you, you don't want to rent to a national tenant and get 20 bucks a foot. Um, you want to rent to a local tenant who's, you know, vibrant in the local economy, but that those rents that they can pay are just not high enough to support large developments like this. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, thank you. Let's see. I see another hand up, Richard Blake. Where he, no, he went down. Uh, TC, I'm assuming that's not town center, but- uh, <laughs> no, uh, TC Hassan Repper at uh, 24 Gayfields Road. Um, I'm a lifelong resident. Uh, I'm actually a commercial broker at uh, NEI, the Dunham Group, which has uh, no affiliation to the, the Dunham course, but, um, just wanted to quickly mention, you know, uh, sort of piggyback on what, what Josh uh, Benzin was saying regarding, you know, the chicken and the egg and getting a, a higher dent population density into that, that town center and, and helping that uh, create sort of a more vibrant downtown area and, and you know, fostering more retail growth, which, um, or, you know, better growth in, in sort of what we have down there. Um, so, you know, that along with, you know, on a, on a personal level, you know, I've lived in Cape my entire life and, you know, having a, uh, an affordable option for, for parents or grandparents to, to be able to downsize and, and stay in the area is, is extremely important and strikes home with me. So I just wanted to um, reiterate that and, um, you know, just give my uh, general support of the project. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's see, I'm hesitating. I saw Richard Blake's hand go up again, then he disappeared again. So, um, okay. Are you there? Y yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, it's just technologically uh, challenging to do some of these things. Sorry for the confusion. Um, I want to make two two points. Um, I was a banker in Portland for 43 years, uh, with uh, ending up with a very large bank. And I basically ran a couple of departments, commercial real estate lending and CRA, which is Community Reinvestment Act investing. Uh, and that was basically uh, uh, affordable housing development. And over the years, we did projects from Northern Maine down to Florida, uh, and a lot in New England. And Nathan was a, uh, uh, a client of ours, I guess. Uh, we invested in three or four of his projects in Portland alone, another one in Exeter, New Hampshire. And from a standpoint of a, an investor, uh, the equity investor who ends up owning a substantial portion of the project, generally 99.99%. Uh, Nathan was an outstanding developer and an, an exceptional manager. And as I say, we did a number of projects with him. And I think the town, if we're going to do this, has the right developer. And I also think they have the right product in the, uh, in the town center. Uh, you don't want to put affordable housing uh, where it's not walkable to town amenities and putting it further down Ocean House Road or out on Bowery Beach Road or something is, is not a good decision. The other part, I, after retiring from the bank, I uh, started a little consulting business helping people and companies uh, refinance or restructure debt or decide what to purchase property for, what the price might be 
doing some feasibility and market analysis and a lot of number crunching. And during that consulting time, I had one customer who wanted to look at purchasing the land that uh, was eventually uh, purchased by the dentist. But as we went through the numbers, it was the requirement of so much commercial space on the first floor was just too much risk for him. And I think it would be too much risk for a bank to underwrite. And subsequently to that, after last fall, I had another customer come in and they wanted to consider purchasing a site and putting some apartments above. But again, the problem of leasing out the first floor, uh, the time which it'll take to lease and the uncertainty of the, uh, um, what the rents would be, uh, that person backed away also. I think the town center project, the town center plan is a good plan, but I think it's the requirement that every first floor have commercial space is unrealistic. Uh, I don't know how long the town center plan has been in existence, but it's been several years. And I think I know of maybe two projects that have been able to develop within the town in that time. So I think Nathan's presenting a great project in the perfect location and I think he will be an outstanding developer and the town will benefit. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Blake. Um, I see another, uh, yeah. Lucas. Mr. Holmitz? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my apologies, uh, as, as I've done before when I haven't uh, known I was going to speak in front of any group. Um, I'm just kind of racing to put my thoughts together. Um, but it just seems like I can't wait too much longer, um, lest, you know, the, the opinions not all be spoken. Um, listening to this whole project, uh, it's been rather interesting to watch how this town treats smaller, uh, let's call them for lack of a better word, entrepreneurs who wanna to try to do things and how they go in front of councils and boards or in front of town planners and are told what you can do and what you cannot do versus to watch somebody who has much greater resources walk in and tell the town council that this is what we're gonna do watch the town council turn to the planning board and say, you know, now tell us what we have to change. And I realize that that might be my interpretation, but uh, you know, not everybody's gone in front of the town planning board. Um, I know there's at least a few people who have, I wonder what this town would look like. It, it, people complain about there not being enough of a developed town center. I wonder what this town would look like if every time they were willing to say, hey, let's change a little bit here because this is a reasonable project or let's not force this smaller person to put a front door here when they've already got two other doors here. It, it's rather frustrating. As I said, I think it's just time to speak up. Um, to, to listen furthermore, uh, to listen to Nathan talk week after week about things like hey, you know, here's, here's exactly what we need. And uh, by the way, I don't even think we're gonna need one parking place per unit. To listen to him say things like, traffic's not gonna be affected, one car every two minutes. If you've driven that town center line during the school hours when kids are trying to get to school, first of all, it's gonna be more than one car per every two minutes at that time. Uh, so again, you know, uh, I just wasn't prepared tonight, but it, this is this project needs a lot more study than you guys are being given. And my great fear for this town, and I'll say it again when it goes back to town council, is that you're rushing this. You're rushing a square peg through a round hole. I wish you guys a lot of luck. This is a tough project. That being said, um, I would I would ask the town now and at a later date change the rules and then see what offers you get. But this just feels like you're changing everything for this one project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Zev, you're up. Hi everyone, uh, Zev Meyerowitz, 12 Hill Way. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. 
I, I want to re reiterate uh, Dr. Hobbix's comment. Um, you know, he personally, I personally, and I'm sure other actual members of the community that have got, tried to go through the process of developing the town. Um, I can't, I can't help but feel a complete sense of um, frustration with the planning board uh, from what I've seen and observed during this process due to the complete um, stochastic nature of, of how submissions are treated when, when coming from a, a small business owner that's community minded versus a large developer. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 most of you on this board were a part of my most recent submission to the town and just the sheer opposition I got to a conforming uh, submission, you know, was, was very, very frustrating. And to hear, you know, you know, that we're holding special workshops and, and repeat processes and considerations of changing, changing the zoning, um, you know, I, I, I too had to encounter the same sources and uses challenges when putting through my building. And at the same time, you know, there was, there was no such conversation and no such opportunity to even have, you know, uses applied to the building that may benefit the town. And so, you know, I, I, I just wanted to be heard that um, the amount of disappointment that I feel as, as a member of this community when in that, in that complete um, separation of treatment is, is very frustrating. Um, that being said, observing this, I, I would strongly urge the planning board whatever language that you do propose, um, you absolutely cannot word it in a way that makes it apparent that it, it only benefits one lot um, and can portray any potential to take uh, market share from adjacent buildings or value from adjacent buildings and provide that to the developer because that, that will be uh, easily um, portrayed as a spot zoning ordinance um, and I'm sure that any any member of this community that's had to go through the process that I have you know would, would take personal offense to that um, and this has happened before uh, the planning board has done this in the past with other buildings in the area and it's not not relevant to mention names but you know I just wanted to be heard just how disappointed I am in observing this process. Thank you. Thank you, Zev. Anybody else's hand up? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'll, I'll close the public comment. Um, I guess the next thing I'd like to do, well, the next thing I had on my list was to uh, start diving into the nuts and bolts, but I saw the uh, email that Maureen sent today. I think, Dan, um, you suggested this, uh, the senior or affordable housing development you saw down in Dover, New Hampshire. I, can you give us, uh, does, this, does that apply at all to what we're doing or? Uh, um, no, <laughs> um, it's, it's just an example, um, kind of, kind of, uh, going down a little bit about what Andrew was talking about, um, and about, you know, is there something we can do either in the town center or outside of the town center? I mean, that really appealed to me that, um, it was very, very interesting, but, it's, it's such a different concept to what's being um, uh, shown before us. So um, I don't know. I mean, Maureen, if you have any comments on that also, but it's very different. So, but I, but it appealed to me. That's why I sent it to her. Did everybody have a chance to read that today? That, that email that Maureen sent out today? Um, well, if you haven't, I mean, it's probably not the time now to really delve into it but um it was well, it, yeah it's, it's very, it was very different i mean these were tiny little um individual 800 square foot um cottages basically kind of around a town center um and i it, think they were it, like 400 square feet or, or something maybe like that. yeah very extremely small one bedroom units but it's very appealing 
So I just thought I would send that to Maureen and just see what she thought about that. But um, okay, thanks, so okay, do you, I don't know if you right now you don't want to pursue it any further, or I I, I don't know how that would yeah. work. Yeah, I don't either. I don't I, either. I don't know how it would work, Jim. Other than you know, going back to what Andrew suggested, is there something we can do? outside of the town center. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in talking about that. So, I mean, I am, but. Okay, I know Maureen, you looked at, uh, you in your memo, you talked about the residency being really the only place that you could put affordable, beside the town center, because it has public water and public sewer, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the, just so you're clear, I, I got Dan's memo and today yesterday, and that's why what you got was very, very late in the day today. And I certainly didn't expect everyone to be able to read it. Um, but it, it was, I think it was uh, not something you would see in a town center. It, and it is anticipated in the town's comprehensive plan. It was called cottage housing, but it's the kind of thing you would really put in a residential district. And so, uh, Mr. Gilbert has said, you know, why are we doing town center? Maybe we can put it in a residential district. And so I've, I've spent, uh, you know, like a rapid learn on this, on this ex real life example, because, I mean, we look at real life examples because it's a good test of our theory of what our zoning requirements are. That's why we apply it to a specific project. And, and in this project, and again, it's, it's not unlike what was anticipated in the comp plan for cottage housing. I just think it is important to know that um, I really, I don't think it's an unreasonable statement to make that if you want affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth, anywhere in Cape Elizabeth, you're gonna have to be willing to make dramatic changes to your zoning. And that project, if you were gonna put it in Cape, would, have, would probably be in the RC district. Um, they, in order to get the approval in Dover, they quadrupled the zoning density allowed where it was built. And so anywhere you wanna put in affordable housing, if you really wanna put in affordable housing, you're gonna to have to look at zoning changes and the comp plan anticipated that. Um, this project in Dover, four times the, the zoning. Um, in Cape, you would probably have to go to a density of no more than one, one unit for every 5,000 square feet, which is the number that Jeff Levine referenced in the presentation you heard on the Metro Coalition. And the density in the RC district is, is 20,000 square feet for one unit. So you, you really do have to look at, you know, enormous, not enormous, but more than just tweaking in order to get affordable housing and get things to the point or you can take advantage of, of the financing that's available. Um, the other point is that project was a 368 square foot single buildings. Um, and they were gonna be charging $950 um, a month for renting them. So those are interesting metrics to think about um, and related to the project that's in front of you. And there's now three little blue hands waving. So yes. <laughs> Carol, Ann's, Carol Ann's up. Uh, I just, so what tack do we want to take? We can pull back and look at affordable housing overall for the town of Cape Elizabeth. We can focus on just affordable housing in the town center, or we can focus on town center regs related to uh, you know, broadening them in some way in overall and not just focus on affordable housing. Those are three things I heard tonight. Okay. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I mean, I, I appreciated what Dan said. I was able to kind of skim it at the end of the day. Um, it, that was the kind of thing I was thinking about. I mean, to be honest, um, this whole conversation about you know how we got here is a bit cart before the horse because of things you know we, we haven't been spurred on to have this larger conversation about affordable housing in the town you know no mandate has been given passed down to us about that and we haven't sort of taken it on a side project and when i sort of suggested that um i think it was the last meeting it was sort of really meant to be like you know maybe we should have a side project of thinking about where else in town should we be thinking about putting affordable housing? Clearly the town is in favor of it. Almost every letter is like, hey, that's a great idea. 
but now you're having to change all these things that everybody spent so much time thinking about. And, you know, to me, that feels like a, a lot more comfortable process, like thinking about that, actually doing planning for it. Um, I, I'm not opposed to in greatly increasing density if it means like you can, you can fit an affordable housing uh, development in, in uh, zone C or whatever. Um, but, you know, it makes me incredibly uncomfortable to then have to talk about changing five ordinances that were, you know, hopefully thoughtfully um, come up for the town center. And so th that's my struggle anyway. Um, and, I, and I think I would like to see that, that sort of side project done because I think it would be helpful to kind of, you know, then the, the, horse, the horses before the cart instead of the other way around. Okay. Thank, thanks, Andrew. Jonathan. Yeah, just uh, I, I'm agreeing with Andrew on this because it's, it's difficult for me to ignore this project that's in front of us. And then when we keep talking about it, um, we then get feedback from the developer who then indicates like, oh, well, if you if you guys make us do this, we won't be able to do that. And I know that it's good feedback to get because we can understand it. But as Andrew just said, I would much rather be able to talk about this broad concept of affordable housing and go through a wish list on what we would like to see for affordable housing in this town, and then really hope that a project will come along that will fit within these guidelines. And I do think that it is it might be necessary, as Maureen just said, that we're going to have to make some changes to allow affordable housing because it does provide a substantial public benefit. Um, but at the same time, just kind of going off this on a whim and trying to, as one of the public comments that was just made, trying to fit a round peg into a square hole is a little bit difficult for me. And, um, and I really think that we are trying to do it for a particular project when we as a planning board should be looking at this in a, at a larger level. Um, one of the big comments that we continually hear, and I, I will credit the developer for making these changes and adding some single or some uh, two bedroom units when they were all single family originally, but is this, okay, if we wanna create affordable housing, um, we wanna create it for families. We wanna create it uh, for that opportunity. So if we were making a wish list of this, would we say that any affordable housing development has 50% multi uh, bedroom dwellings along those lines? I don't know, um, but it is a conversation that we basically can't even have when we are trying to tailor this discussion towards the one development in front of us and the one application in front of us. And I just don't think that that to me is how we should be crafting this conversation. Okay. Agreed. Yeah, all good points. Um, me, I think the town center to me is the only place that we could practically fit affordable housing because of its proximity to the IGA, to other services, to the schools, if there are some families that live in there, because maybe we change some uh, ordinances in the R R uh, RC district, but the people would still need a car to get to where they're going. There's no bus service. So with all that, I think uh, whatever we decide with, it, to me, it's, it's a town center district or it's not going to happen because I don't think it's practical. Um, we also need to keep in mind, it's been, I'm not sure I'm saying it right, that uh, the first floor retail, retail has changed radically over the last few years. And uh, we've already heard from people who try to fill those spaces that there's tough to do. So, uh, you know, that's something that we're, you know, we have another list to talk about tonight. Obviously, I said something that annoyed somebody. I like that all these hands rate came up. Or, or they agreed with you. Oh, I know. Andrew, go ahead. Mine, mine was still up, Jim. Mine was still up. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I will politely, politely disagree a little bit with that. Only, only in so much as, you know, actually in conversation with a colleague of mine today, I worked in young professional who you know frankly when I told her what the one bedroom cost was for the low income housing she's like I couldn't afford that but she has a car she commutes to our office she goes to the grocery store elsewhere you know um, I think 
my point is actually that it, it kind of needs more study. It's not, and I totally agree. I think it makes the most sense. I mean, obviously, you know, sewer and water for one, don't go far outside of the town center. So these are necessarily probably going to be, you know, closer to the town center. And I think it makes all the sense in the world for it to be closer. But I think, you know, looking at all the available space and distance to the schools and stuff, it, I think it just needs more study. And I, I, I don't think, I, I'm kind of doubting town center is the only place this could happen because that's a fairly small area. And there's actually, you know, residential zones that are just, just outside of the town center that are definitely still in walking distance. Um, so I, I don't think we should, you know, sort of rush to judgment that town center is the only place. Um, I, I, it would, and I think it would really take study and maybe that's even like the town hiring an outside firm to do like a, a full on study, whether that's economics of like how much could, you know, like basically kind of what the developers done, right? How much would it, would it cost to build these things? How much could we get from the state for the units? How, you know, what does land cost need to be to, to make this happen? Do we have that land? I mean, maybe it does come back to like, there's only one parcel in the entire town, um, you know, but I just think it needs more study. And I think we can't just say it can't exist outside of the town center. How would you study it? What would you do? I don't study these things, so I, I couldn't exactly tell you, but I, I'm sure it would probably be both sort of a mapping exercise, a real estate exercise, an economics exercise. Um, you know, it you know, it's probably a lot of the things, like I said, the developer's doing, but we're thinking about it on, on a more of a town-wide basis. Okay, Marianne. Jim, I raised my hand because I agreed with you. Um, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth for 37 years. This is, I think, the first proposal I've ever seen. And you know, we hear a lot about people saying they're for affordable housing, but when you drill down into the um, questions that were asked of people during the comp plan, what you quickly see is that fi almost 50% of the people in Cape Elizabeth are opposed to any development ever. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here. It's only going to happen in the town center. It's not going to happen in some of the closer residential districts. Um, and uh, I, the, it seems to me that the current town center ordinance is itself a failure. All you have to do is look at all of the empty space. I don't see uh, a clamor for development. Um, I think the requirement to have commercial on the first floor is often inconsistent with what people want living above. Nobody wants to live above a pub or a pizzeria. Um, you know, it sounds good to think, oh, we can go into our town center and go to a pub and have a glass of wine or go to a pizza place. But frankly, people aren't going to want apartments above those areas. And at the same time, we have a lot of empty space, which suggests to me that uh, the town center ordinance is itself not working. So I would like to focus uh, on seeing what we can do to um, have something that really is a public benefit in bringing 39, uh, potentially 39 or 36 units of affordable housing is to me a public benefit, um, but I don't want to rush it. I don't know that we can get this done by April, um, but I think that we ought to be looking at this proposal because it's the only one that's come before the town in God knows 40 years. There used to be affordable housing. I bought my first house in Elizabeth Park for $50,000. And I think those houses now are selling for 400,000. So, um, you know, we, we need to do something. The, the, the town um, speaks uh, with a lot of liberal thoughts, but what we have done has been very conservative in our approach. And it's, it's really time that we have some uh, more diverse housing, 
which will bring more diversity to the people in this town. Thank you, Marianne. Al. Al? Uh, yep. I, I think I'm in the same sphere as Andrew and, and Jonathan, but a couple other points. We talk about affordable housing, but there's different levels of affordable housing. I believe Nathan's proposal is at 60% of AMI. There's 60% AMI, 80% AMI, 100% AMI. So the discussion on affordable can have a considerable variation in what level is affordable, what demographics are being served, and what are the price points. Overall, density is a big issue in Cape that I think indirectly affects affordability. Um, the minimum half acre zoning in the RC district uh, limits the number of homes that can be built. The greater you can in increase inventory, the more pricing can be affected. Um, and then relative to Mary Ann's points about residential over commercial, our Virginia office was within a new town center in the county that our office was located. There was residential above our office use. There was a residential above the restaurant uses and a small grocery. Um, they had no issues leasing those spaces um, above the commercial uh, from the residential side. And I believe the, the Rosemont market has been successful in having condominiums above it. Um, so I think they can be complementary uses um, if done appropriately. Um, and I think all of that would, would have an impact on um, how we look at the town center. Okay. Well, the water is muddy. Um, <laughs> what I had planned for tonight, I'm not sure we can even get close. Here's what I had. Here's what I had planned was get close to a final, you know, not finalized, but get close to a final draft of the amendments, provide information to Maureen so she could start drafting a letter that would accompany the amendments and then uh, schedule public hearing for April 20th and table what we're talking about work on it at the workshop in April, and then we will talk about it again at the uh, April meeting. And after everything going on tonight, I, I don't know. Um, I guess we can keep, to me, the hardest thing is we need to make a decision about the first floor commercial. And we go back and forth and back and forth and we've heard it said that if we demand that then it's not going to happen um and we do know there's some empty spaces in town um i don't know i'm going back and forth right now i i, would, I had my my thoughts all set and then with everything the water's muddy al you got your hand up I don't know if Maureen knows about the project, but the South Portland Housing Authority is currently under construction at 611 Main Street in South Portland. I believe there's 42 to 48 units of affordable housing over 7,000 square feet of commercial. I don't know any particulars relative to what they're doing on leasing. I quickly looked at it while we're sitting here. It looks like um, the commercial space is for lease, but I didn't know if, if we were gonna do any research projects, if Maureen could potentially discuss that project and how they were making the financing work. Um, because that to me seems very similar to what the town was looking for in the in the town center district. I guess Maureen and Nathan, do either of you know anything about that project? Or Kristen or Robert? I don't know much about it. Um, 
I guess I would just point out that that's, that's on Main Street in South Portland, uh, which I believe is Route 1 there. Um, and so there's, it's a much different kind of commercial environment than, than uh, the town center of Cape Elizabeth. It's busier. There's a lot more cars that drive by there. Um, so it, to me, it just at first blush, it looks to me like a much more viable commercial location than something in the, in the Cape Elizabeth Village Center that's set so far back from the road. Okay, thank you. Jamie. Um, thanks, Jim. I, I wasn't planning to speak again, but I, I, I just want to leap onto the example that you just started off with, with the one of the requests being the, the waiver of the first floor retail requirement. So again, I'm not part of the planning board, uh, you know, not, not my job to necessarily um, think in this way, but I think if I was to use that as an example where to, to come back to this whole questionability of the qu question of both feasibility and consistency. Um, you know, if you think about a, a lot like this, where there's, there's four developable lots within the um, overall site, two of which, you know, one of which is moving forward with a commercial purpose on the first floor, the other of which envisions solely a commercial purpose with potentially nothing else to it. I think when you think about that question of consistency and spirit, you know, it is that enough of an overall contiguous development um, where, you know, you then get to the point of saying, okay, well, I, I don't, I don't know how the, I don't know how the wording would be, uh, you know, drafted in an ordinance, but a certain percentage of all of that equals commercial space. And, and again, you're, you've got an example that's consistent with um, the overall intent of, of previous town center um, uh, ordinance. Does that make sense? Like, I think so. I, I think I think where where the town council was probably going, and certainly where where my mind immediately goes to is, um, um, I think as I tried to articulate before, you know, putting guardrails around what's drafted, such that it it doesn't envision, um, you know, a whole bunch of mushrooming on other on other. Um, properties or sites or things like that. But if you, if you think about this in totality of what this entire development is, um, you know, what, what impact does that have to what gets drafted? So it, it's just a thought I had because you were bringing up the specific first floor retail requirement, but. Thank you, Jamie. Jonathan. Yeah. So uh, to me, I, I, and I have to just kind of put this current application that we've been asked to discuss aside um, how I look at, to me, how we should approach this is uh, what do we want to, because we recognize affordable housing as a public benefit, I mean, one, how do we define public or how do we define uh, affordable housing exactly? And what do we want from that affordable housing? Something like I mentioned, do we want it to be single bedroom, double bedroom? I, <clears throat> I personally uh, would probably be okay if... Uh, giving an exception to the commercial uh, real estate on the front on the, or uh, sorry, not commercial, non-residential uh, space on the first floor. But with that said, I would not be approving a height change in giving an extra floor um, because I don't think that that would be in the spirit of what the town center is going with height requirements. Um, I was willing to do the height requirement change uh, to give the, uh, to have an applicant uh, who might want to put three floors of affordable housing above a commercial space. But to me, it's almost like you don't get both. It's one or the other. Commercial space with an extra, um, extra floor or no commercial space, but you get, you don't get that height. So that's sort of how I am envisioning um, where this was going, because then that would be consistent with the other properties in town that haven't been afforded that opportunity to go higher. Um, so that I think we have to kind of have a discussion as a board on what we want to see an affordable housing um, amendment uh, look like 
outside of the idea of this applicant and, and what's here. And I, I know that's troubling probably for the applicant who's put a lot of time and money into this effort. Uh, at the same time, though, I think that that's really, to me, where the, the conversation um, should be going. What do we as a board want to see uh, for, for people who want to provide a public benefit, uh, but as Maureen has told us, we'll have to go outside of what the town center zoning is at this time. And as Mary Ann said, maybe this is just something that the town council really needs to take on outside of this whole project or this whole thing that we're going through right now is whether or not they need to look at town center zoning um, as a policy maker, as opposed to us as looking at a particular project. Thank you, Andrew. So I was thinking about what um, Jamie said, and I mean, I think it's an interesting idea and I, I totally get the, um, the idea of the concept of sort of, you know, thinking about what, what amount of square, face, square space could exist, say in commercial on first floor, if you had four, develop, four lots, say they were each 5,000, that's, you know, 20,000 square feet. If one could, you know, if basically that, that whole development could be, you know, all the commercials in one building, that's 20,000 square feet or, or whatever, you know, just using that example, um, that, that being sort of like the idea. However, in this case, this development's already been put in place with, with you know, under the current ordinances, I, I don't think, Maureen, that we could really stipulate something like, you know, lot four must have all commercial in it. I mean, is that even a possibility? Well, I think we need to remember that um, none of this discussion is talking about public property. Uh, right. Uh, we're yeah, all, I mean, there's no public property that's being offered to a developer and asking them to provide a proposal. So when you're talking the town center or where you're talking residential districts, you're waiting for a private property owner to say, ooh, 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 I want to be the one that does this. And, you know, they're not. So that's the first piece. The second piece is these, and, and because these lots have been approved and they've been approved under zoning. So uh, you can't just go back and tell them they have to do something different. If they ask you for zoning changes, then, then you have opened the gates to some negotiation. Um, but they are already been approved as, as commercial, as, as they've already been approved as lots. Um, that, that's and not my point. They, yeah, they're, they're, right now they're approved lots. They can come in and submit a site plan application for uses that are currently allowed. Um, mm -hmm. The board can't retroactively go back and say, you have to do X. Okay, I got a question, something Al uh, mentioned, Nathan, Nathan, Kristen, Robert, um, I'm fairly ignorant in the world of affordable housing. And Al used the term 60% an 80 per, AMI, 80% and 100%. And you're proposing 60%, correct, Nathan? Right, right. How do your metrics change if you go 80 to 100? I, I don't know if you can even answer that. But. No, we can definitely answer that because it's right in our wheelhouse. The big, the big effect of going to 80 or 100, would, well, there, there would be two big effects. One is that we would lose all of the, affordable housing tax credits that you get for building housing for people at 60% or below AMI, area median income. You don't, there, there currently is no program available with tax credits or anything like that for people earning 80 or 100%. So that would be a huge hit to our budget. Um, not only do you lose the, the equity that investors will pay for those tax credits, but you also lose subsidy that goes along with them from the main state housing authority. What you get in, what you, the benefit would be you could charge more rent because people who are at 80 or 100% of area median income have higher income so they can afford a higher rent. But the higher rent that you can charge would not even come close to making up the loss of equity and subsidy, which is why frankly, we're proposing them at 60%, um, not at 80% or 100% because okay. that's how we can make the numbers work. Um, and we also like serving people in that lower, you know, lower end of the wage scale um, because they're underserved typically. Um, so 
while developers can can put pro, uh, units in at 80% or 100% when they're doing high-end rentals, um, they can mix in those, that's what's sometimes called inclusionary zoning, where you mix in some 80% or 100% units. Or if you're doing condos, you can mix in some units that are lower priced condos to try to hit that 80% or 100% of median target. Um, but that's that's very different than what we're what we're proposing. Um, we're not doing condos and we're not doing high-end market rate rentals. We're doing sort of middle, middle of the road um, in terms of fit and finish and cost to try to serve kind of middle income people. So that's a longer answer maybe than you wanted, but if we tried to serve 60, uh, tried to serve 80 and 100% people in our project, the project would be, become infeasible. Okay, all right, good to know. Good to um, I wanna try and move this off dead center. Um, all great comments tonight, and I, I thank everybody for that, very thoughtful. Um, Maureen had given us two options of amendments. One, the difference between the two is one, uh, as I remember, is the requirement for first floor commercial. I mean, there's no requirement for first floor commercial in one of them, and there is in the other. Correct, Maureen? Correct. All right. Um, I'm going to call on each one of you. I want to know if you're uh, leaning towards uh, eliminating the requirement for first floor commercial or not. So we can at least decide if we're going to, and if you all, if enough people want first floor commercial, we need to know that. All right. So we don't waste our time. So Marianne. Jim, can I, there's another hand from, I think one of the applicants. Oh, Robert, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Jonathan. Robert, can, are you are you on? Uh, are you muted? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. I, 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 I just wanted to comment on the feasibility of uh, of the retail space. Uh, first of all, with another hat on, I'm, I'm involved as uh, one of the companies that's a sister company to Zan Company is the manager of uh, Pond Cove, and we've managed that 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 um, Pond Cove for many many years, and we are really struggling to try to fill up. Um, the, the vacant space that's in Pond Cove right now. Um, and I just got an email also from uh, Josh Benthian who spoke earlier. And uh, he had spoken to Brandon Mitchell who's the leasing agent for the South Portland project and they cannot find any tenants for that space right now. Retail is, um, is struggling in so many different ways right now. And a lot of those ways don't have to do with, you know, where they're located in the town of Cape Elizabeth. A lot of them have to do with the fact that people have changed the way they shop. Um, and they, you know, the traditional small retail shop in the store is just in a really difficult place right now and really struggling. And it's no matter where you are, no matter where you're located, you can be in Times Square. Um, it's just almost impossible and very difficult to get viable retail right now. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Sure uh, thing. I guess I, I uh, as I've done before in these questions, I always go first. If I'm going to make everybody else answer the question, I need to do it too. So I am in favor of getting rid of the first floor commercial for affordable housing uh, projects with the, uh, you know, depending what the other, what else we're doing we're going to change, but the, in general, uh, I'm okay with not having first floor commercial slash retail. So Jonathan, yeah, I know. I'm because I said that Marianne first, but you're, you moved around on my screen. So now you're right there top left. So. All right. Um, so I am still in favor of keeping the commercial space. Um, but I am, and, and again, not to muddy the waters, but I would be willing to give an extra floor um, in exchange for keeping that commercial space. I would be in favor of getting rid of that commercial space, but I would not be in favor of increasing the height requirement if we give get rid of that commercial space. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carol Ann. Uh, as said before, I would not be opposed to getting rid of the commercial space because um, I do not, uh, I do not want to see it go 
any building go to five stories in order to support the commercial space in the first place. Okay. Daniel. I, I'm in favor of keeping the commercial space and um, throwing this back on the developer. Is there any other way that you can make this project work financially? I mean, you talked about- Can I um, interrupt here? Can I interrupt here? I, I'm sorry. We are discussing the ordinances. We are not discussing the submission of a project. And the developer has provided all kinds of awesome information for us in order to think about this, but they should not be part of this discussion. Yep. Thank you, Carolyn. So, I don't know. Oh, so Jim, uh, again, um, I'm in favor of keeping the commercial space. Thank you. Okay, Al. I'm in favor of keeping it. I'm an engineer, so I read things somewhat literal. The order from the council requests zoning amendments permitting unaffordable housing project. And currently as drafted, the ordinance option two allows for doubling of the density. It allows an additional story or 10 feet. It allows doubling the footprint and it allows flexibility on parking. All of those items to me meet the definition of what the council's asking so that it, it allows unaffordable housing project, whether it allows this affordable housing project is for the developer to, to determine. So I would keep the first floor non-residential space. Okay, Andrew, thank you, Al. I think um, uh, I'm for keeping the commercial, I actually like Jonathan's thought that uh, essentially you can trade one or the other, but not have both in terms of raising up um, versus commercial. Okay, thank you. Marianne. I am in favor of eliminating the commercial space in the manner that uh, had been presented to us by Maureen. That is a narrowly tailored uh, amendment that applies to lots that are, or developments that are 200 feet back from the road. I think we determined last uh, month when we talked about this, that that would apply to about four lots in the town center. So I would um, support getting rid of the commercial requirement for those lot, those developments that are set way back. Thank you. So the way I see that is four, Four members of the board want to keep the first floor commercial. Three members of the board are willing to discuss getting rid of it. So um, unless somebody's, unless I'm misreading this, then we would be wasting our time trying to get talk, uh, continue discussion on first floor commercial. Is that the consensus? Yes. All right. Well, Jim, I mean, I think you heard from myself and I think it was Andrew who said that we'd be willing to discuss it, but without the caveat that we they be able to go up another ten feet. So I don't I don't know where that leaves us, but um, again, it's it's very difficult when it's an applicant that needs all these things, and that wouldn't fit to what that applicant needs. So okay. I don't know where that leaves us, but. Oh. Well, for the. Okay. Wait a minute. You about to say something, Marianne? Yeah, I, I guess for the purposes of moving forward, I would suggest then that we um, continue to discuss option two and set option two for a public hearing. It's not, it's not the option I like, but I, I when I served on the council, I could learn to count to four, so. <laughs> um, so let's set option two to public hearing. Okay. Worst thing that happens is it comes back to us and we have to go over it again.
Does anybody have a problem with that? I mean, I know you said Jonathan, but um, yeah, because uh, obviously I don't know the numbers, but enough of the developers have said they need to have meet certain metrics or it's not affordable. So um, I guess we can have first floor residential, but the building not high enough and maybe another developer can come in. Okay. Um, so, but I, based on what we've heard, I don't think it's going to happen. We can, we can move forward with option two and discuss it some more at the next workshop. If everybody's willing to do that. Fine. All right. Um, so let's move on. Jim, I think Marianne has her hand up. Oh, oh I I'm sorry. I just didn't lower it. You got okay. yellow walls on my screen, Marianne, so I can't see your hand up. So. Oh, well, I just lowered it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Dan. Yeah. Um, you know, getting back to the discussion about, um, and I, uh, you know, uh, really studying this and really not trying to get this done by the end of April. I mean, I'm, I'm in favor right now of, of, of really kind of looking at this ordinance and talking about what, um, what our ordinances need to look like for affordable housing. I don't know, I just, it just feels like this is, in, in my opinion, it just feels so rushed. Um, I mean, I, I think, I, I, so, you know, I, I just think by April 30th is gonna be very difficult to get this done. Um, that's my opinion. How would more time make you change your mind though? Doing what I, you know, I, I sent, Jim, I sent that to, to, to Maureen and she sent that, that concept, um, you know, taking a look and, and I know that this developer has done a great job putting this all together. And um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just think that, um, that we just need to uh, just spend more, I, it's a hard question to answer. <laughs> you know, I'm not an expert in affordable housing, but um, I don't know, that's just my opinion, so. Jonathan. Jim, just, uh, I mean, for the purpose of tonight, I, I, I would agree that we just move this on to the next one, but I do have a question for Jamie, if he's willing to answer. Um, at what point, Jamie, will, or would the town council be willing to take on this idea that we've been batting around tonight about, changing the zoning and affordable housing and what the wish list were for the council would be or something along those lines. I, I think that to me, that's where this should be headed in the direction towards of the, um, the town council making some decisions. And obviously I know it just like you have done with numerous other uh, zoning amendments, like for instance, the short-term rental that we were just working on that it does come to us and, and we give you our thoughts and then um, we give you, and then it sends back to you, but I mean, it's the town council have an appetite to uh, take this on sort of separate from this application, the specific application, I should say. Um, yeah, I mean, if I think back to the development of the comprehensive plan and, and, and approval of, of that update, you know, in 2019, heading into early 2020, um, you know, we had developed a work plan with all of the recommendations that came out of the the, the comprehensive plan. Um, and, you know, we had looked at what were some of the sort of near, medium and long-term things. And, and my recollection on that, Maureen was intimately involved in that process of, of sort of um, taking all of those recommendations and turning them into action items is that there wasn't something that specifically associated with affordable housing that came out of that in the same way that short-term rentals did, right? Of addressing that as a problem. But, you know, um, I, think, I think the council took the information from the comprehensive plan to say, focusing on the need to both diversify the type of housing and, the, and ensuring um, availability of a diverse uh, pool of housing stock, as well as, um, you know, increasing the actual number of affordable housing units was something that mattered to the community, was something that was outlined in the comprehensive plan. But like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure that 
associated specific action items were put to it in the same way as maybe some other things. That's number one. Um, number two, I think that as you guys have hit on and others have talked about in the discussion that, you know, this is a bit of a chicken and egg situation where, you know, with, with all due respect to, you know, some of the others who spoke earlier about being critical of their own developments and past processes and things like that. I, I think as Marion said, certainly in my recollection, and I'm, I haven't lived here as long, I've lived here 20 years, but, you know, I don't remember anybody ever bringing forward a proposal of this type with this specific, you know, type of proposal and public benefit and all that kind of thing. Um, and I don't think it's the planning board's job, yours or, or past planning boards to, when somebody comes forward with a proposal, say, well, if you did this, then it would have a public benefit and maybe there'd be some flexibility. I think the planning board and the council react to the proposals that are brought before them and judge them on those merits. And, and, and you know, that's generally how the process works. Um, going back to your question though, Jonathan, um, I, I certainly think that there's interest and appetite on the part of the council for, and it, you know, it was built into our goal plan that we just adopted um, on Monday, um, which, you know, um, while I don't think it specifically calls out affordable housing, talks about, um, you know, being focused on issues of, of equity and, and, and so on and so forth that, um, you know, past councils haven't probably looked at quite as hard um, because the, the, the need wasn't as present as it seems to be now. So does that answer your question? I don't know. No, that's great. Thank you. That's helpful. Well, do we want to send this back up to the town council and say, give us more specific direction? I don't know if that's the right way to say it, instead of trying to come up with our own. I, Jim, to me, I, I think this is a policy decision that the town council has to make. I, I just do. I don't know. That's my I thought. I can see it. Um, instead of beating ourselves up about the specifics of the ordinance changes. Yeah, but what would that direction look like? Um, come up with affordable housing, it would still come back and come up with amendments to make affordable housing, right? Well, Jim, it might look like something like, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that it sounds like commercial space isn't always working in these buildings. So it's probably a broader look at like, you know, maybe the town center plan, even though I'm looking at it now, adopted in 2014, didn't really hit the mark. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I'm not a commercial developer, but I mean, there, 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 there could be some, um, you know, survey of, of commercial developers or so, something that could at least look at like, why, why wouldn't you want to develop here? What would it need? How would it need to look to, to make it um, more interesting? And then say, say it's like, well, we really only need we need x y or z i don't know and then what does the town look town center look like what space is available um these are the other goals that we want to achieve including affordable housing what would that look like maybe we don't need commercial space and everything i mean it, it would really be much better if the town if the the council because this is a policy issue to come back and say these are really what what we need to change you guys just need to craft it narrowly so that it it sounds good and works I feel like this is going round and round on, on something that doesn't make sense really right now for the board to do. I mean, that's my opinion. I think it's sort of what Jonathan's saying, to be honest. Hmm. Um, well, I don't know. Do we want to table it tonight and, and, and table it and go to the workshop? Or I guess we could schedule it for April, the April meeting, Maureen? So it sounds like you have four people who are um, more comfortable with option two. So I, I, with, I mean, just trying to end the misery for tonight, uh, perhaps someone could make a motion to table option two to the, January, to the April 20th meeting for a public hearing, because eventually you have to hold a public hearing and you have to send a recommendation to the council. So there's nothing that says you can't hold more than one public hearing, but it makes sense to at least let the public comment on a specific proposal, and then you can decide what you're gonna do with their comments. 
And then you can also table it to the April 6th workshop. And I intend to have a draft companion piece ready for you to look at that you can start to edit. And there are several other items that look like they're gonna be in that workshop. So you won't be spending a lot of time on this item anyway. All right, Al, you have your hand up. Thank you, Maureen. Just one question from Maureen and it really doesn't need an answer tonight just for her to consider. Under the affordable housing in a mixed use building, it defines it as at least 36 units. And then under the parking, it defines it as at least 70% of the units. Would you want those to be defined the same way? And if not, why not? I think those, I mean, those, first of all, the definition of the affordable housing in a mixed use building is, is history now because that's not included in the second option. So we don't have to do no, it. No, it still yeah. is. It is on the one I have. Yeah. Right, the option to delete that definition change because you don't need it because a mixed use building wouldn't be need a definition change because you would not have, you would not be deleting that first floor non-residential use. And the 70% and the 36 doesn't have to match. Those, there's no magic to those numbers. The intent was, to try to quantify what you would consider substantial enough to amend your zoning ordinances. And if you're going to amend your ordinances because you wanna promote affordable housing, I'm assuming you wanna get a lot of affordable housing and, and you don't want someone to just throw in one unit and be able to take advantage of all of this. So there's no magic to those numbers and there, there's nothing that says they have to match. Okay. All right. So. Oh, I would move. Can I make a motion? Yes, you may. I would move that we set option two, which has the support of four planning board members to a public hearing on what date was it you suggested, Maureen? It's the last page of the memo you received. That's page two of the memo and it's April 20th, 2021. April 20th, okay. That's my motion. Second. Um, Maureen, please call the roll. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Okay. And before we table this, I would like to ask Maureen if she can prepare a brief history or record of affordable workforce, low-income housing in Cape Elizabeth in the last 50 years, including how many actual proposals have been made. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a motion to table? So moved. Are you tabling it to the workshop? Uh, yes. April 6th workshop, option two. I, have a second. I guess I have one Wait, question. Did we already vote on this? Oh, never mind. So we voted on a public hearing. What were your concerns, Marianne? Um, I guess I'm wondering whether we should just have the public hearing now. I don't know how much more work we will get done in a workshop. That is true. And so I wonder if we shouldn't have the public hearing at the next, uh, I guess I'd like to amend my motion, have the public hearing at the next meeting and then potentially have another workshop after we hear from the public. 
concern. Maureen, you had your hand up. No, I, I mean, that's definitely a, mo a way forward. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because you're right. We, we do, according to you, Maureen, we've got a lot of stuff already under workshop. Mm -hmm. And we're probably we're going to go round and round again to like what we've been doing. So, so you want to you want to put the uh, public hearing at March sixteenth? No, I guess we could leave the public hearing for that April date. I just don't see a reason for us to have a workshop on this again okay. until we've had a public hearing. Okay. And I I, I, I don't. Can, I can agree. Makes sense to me. So we don't need a, a motion to table the workshop. So. Okay. Already, okay. So I withdraw my motion. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh no, we have uh, we have to talk about other things. Um, yeah. Can can we let Jamie leave? <laughs> <laughs> he has to stay. Did Jamie send you a note and said, please let it say, please no, let he me. should be as miserable as the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you forget it's budget week. Uh, so I just, I just want to thank you guys. Um, you know, I, I reiterate certainly wasn't the intent of the council to put you in a difficult position. Um, I know that this is a tricky issue uh, as many can be, but um, thank you for the time and, and thoughtful consideration that you guys gave us tonight. Um, I frankly enjoyed participating and hearing the discussion. It's useful, you know, for us for down the road. So um, I just assume be a part of it than, than not. So thank you very much. If you, I, I'm completely available to anybody that wants to talk about it and has other questions though, if, if anything comes up. So thank, thank you. you. Appreciate you taking the time to be here. Yep. You bet. Take care guys. You too. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Wait, don't we have the other business thing? No, I, I, it's not on there. I guess uh, oh, we do have one question. If we ever get Zoom bombed, Maureen, do we have a procedure to follow? We don't have some cat. And yeah, you, you've got, well, first of all, you know, it's a webinar. So there's a lot more control than a regular meeting. And the meetings are the ones that are more vulnerable to Zoom bombing. And then, yeah, this is why you, I look confused most of, confused most of the time because I'm trying to be really careful about activating and promoting and, and, you know, demoting and, you know, there's, I'll, I'm supposed to kill mics if people get out of, out of control, so. <laughs> oh no. Jonathan, yeah. watch out. Any other questions or comments? I think, I think that's the Carol Ann button. I think that's what that's called. <laughs> no, no, you guys are fine. It's, you know, folks from elsewhere. All right, um, so I motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Many seconds on that one. All right, Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes, and I, I will just also say thank you to all. This was a good discussion tonight and appreciate all you guys' insight. And Chair Hubner. Yes. And we'll good night, see. everyone. Good night. We'll see you good night. Uh, April good 6th. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.